Um, I'm Chris Masseau, I'm one of the data scientists um, at Mango Solutions. Um, and my background is, uh, I guess, fairly, fairly varied. Um, I kind of came at the whole sort of analytics route sort of uh, via computer science and uh, along the route sort of picked up quite a few um, sort of languages, so a bit of background in, in MATLAB, but my primary uh, sort of area now is Python. But alongside in that journey, I've also picked up quite a bit of R, so I'm kind of the sort of more sort of jack of all trades, I guess, sort of a member of the team. Um, and uh, so a few of you may recognise me from the workshop I did um, on Monday, where I was talking to you a lot about like having a sort of Flask, uh, sorry, sort of R and Python within uh, one particular uh, pipeline. And today I'm going to talk to you, to talk to you about a uh, Python library called Flask and how I've used that to build a uh, web application. As this is the applications section, I thought that would be very fitting. Um, so yeah, so first of all, I'm going to sort of hopefully convince you the need that you know wrapping sort of your analytics within some kind of sort of web portal is is kind of a very good um, idea. And I see that there was um, sort of uh, there was a previous uh, presentation earlier uh, by Alistair who um, actually after stringing a lot of these different technologies together into a pipeline, the actual way the user would interface um, with it was through this uh, kind of very similar combination with using this Flask pipeline and, and Python. So I'll go over what Flask is in a bit more detail um, and why we chose it and um, uh, why we sort of uh, built a decision point out of it. A little bit over the architecture and then I will um, give you a live demo, hopefully, and cross my fingers um, during that process. And uh, yeah, so I guess right from the start, sort of why do you want some kind of sort of decision-making sort of centralized portal? Well, we're in an increasingly data-driven world. Um, that's surely no surprise to any of you. And you want to leverage all of this data uh, to make better decisions and also to build products. But I think the key thing here is that everyone's doing a lot of analysis, but you need to actually share this insight that is gained um, in a reproducible um, and robust fashion. Um, and that's kind of lending it itself. If everyone's doing it, doing it in their own way, then you're going to have to start running into problems of uh, reproducibility and guaranteeing that, okay, this, this image that you show me, this report, you know, what, what code generated that? When you come back to it six months later, when you're delving through this, um, you want to actually get that kind of, that sort of like history trail and that provenance. Um, and a good, a good reason why is because the whole sort of data science process is kind of, you know, it, it is part art and part science. Um, there is no silver bullet that's going to work with every single problem. And there's always going to be that investigation stage and what, you, what you've tried, why it failed and everything else. So you kind of need to have this well documented and, and very well uh, reproducible. So to kind of sort of put a, a lot of common ways of, of sharing insight on this sort of continuum, um, I like to think of it as going from the very dynamic through to the, the, the very sort of static. And this is kind of just a, this doesn't include all, all possible options, but I just thought I'd give you a handful. So you, on the really, really dynamic end, you've kind of got your sort of BI dashboard type interfaces where you've kind of got access to this sort of cube of data that someone has very nicely produced for you. And you can slice it, you can dice it, you can visualize different subsets. And it's kind of left up to you to find the interesting stuff. Um, but you do have access to you know, all the freedom to explore the data yourself. And then kind of if it's for a more sort of uh, marketing slant, then you may be um, sort of sharing these insights via sort of you know, in infographics, which can sometimes be static, sometimes you know, via the web and, and, and interactive. Um, so that can be one way to sort of like share these insights to the masses and hopefully um, uh, get feedback from that. But you've also got things like automated reporting. So you now you want the data to change, and so the report is sort of you know a bit dynamic, but it's going to be the same report generated either quarterly or annually or however. So it's sort of those in the middle of the spectrum. And then I guess the main sort of focus of what I've, I'm kind of aiming at today is these sort of analytics style reports, which sort of step, sit one step back from kind of the old school, very static sort of scientific publications that take you know a long time to kind of get there and get accepted, and then they're sort of set in stone very much, and they're sort of there. Um, so it's, it's the kind of sort of, I guess, the white papers or, or like the, you know, the in-depth analytical reports, um, and that's the kind of sort of uh, target area that I'll be um, talking about today. So in generating these sort of, uh, the, these reports, and um, there's kind of two sides that, where uh, you'll commonly run into some problems. So in doing the actual analytics, you've always got to worry about things like sharing code, making sure it's definitely reproducible when someone else is running your code, um, having an audit trail if someone made a change, who made it and why, 
Um, and then also, if you've got a lot of these projects on the go, um, you want to actually be able to find the relevant pro projects as quickly as possible when um, you, know, you ask by your boss the last minute, okay, what have you done with this project? Okay, yeah, you've definitely got to go send it off. That is definitely the version that works. Um, and then on the reporting side, You've kind of got, okay, when you're putting all these documents together, if you're going sort of very old school and kind of building up, you know, with Word docs and everything else, then you're starting to sort of copy and paste by hand all of these pictures in, and that can be exceptionally error prone. Um, and you also want to guarantee some nice publication quality graphics at the end of this process. Uh, so you definitely, you know, you don't want to be relying on like Excel charts, really. Um, and you also want to be able to share this report. You may not want it to just go to out to everyone in your company, so you may want to target this, and maybe the, the data is a little sensitive. Um, so there can be issues around that. Uh, how these all get stored, whether they're just in um, you know one sort of like backed up file system or um, or just spread individually on people's laptops, that can be that can be problematic. And also, there's kind of more of a need for more interactivity these days with, with uh, like the visualizations um, that go alongside them. So people are getting you know, used to seeing flashy, shiny things, and having just a dull PNG to stare at is, is starting to you know, not, be, not be what they expect. So there are obviously a lot of tools already that help out in very, various parts of this. So version control takes care of a lot of the uh, reproducibility issues and setting up, uh, you know, having a good audit trail. You can f right from the uh, beginning right through to you know the current sort of version of of, um, of the code base. Um, and also on the reporting side, you can get these sort of like more um, sort of technologies that help to blend sort of writing your report and the code that then gets inserted into the report. So you've got the sort of NITAR and LaTeX, and through this you can automate reports and guarantee that these numbers you know, are recalculated each time and that you can you know, have a lot of faith that they're right and removes the, the, um, the uh, sort of hand-coded error part. Um, and of course, like towards the end of the spectrum, if you want to you know, give very um, imp impressive uh, visualizations that are interactive in a very short space of time, then Shiny is kind of the go-to tool um, for that. And I guess also um, the, the other things that, that we found uh, sort of talking to a lot of clients is there is, you know, there's this big sort of shift to doing more visualizations in the browser. And so um, Shiny's not the, the only player in town. You've got uh, Plotly and there's uh, also the Bokeh library, which has come along fairly recently. Um, there's actually now a uh, API uh, into that for uh, both Python and R. So it's kind of like big, become very sort of technology agnostic. Um, and uh, it's all sort of become possible because by targeting the browser, you then sort of guarantee this area of cross-platform like you know compatibility. Um, you sort of shifted it a little bit and just sort of made sure you know that the browsers sort of, sort of just take care of that. But also alongside, you've had a lot of advances with the JavaScript technologies. So a lot of the libraries have already been been written. There are so many out there these days. Um, I always lose track. Um, but uh, the uh, uh, browser companies have also put a lot of effort into kind of you know optimizing JavaScript over the years. So what didn't used to be possible is now very possible, and JavaScript has you know had orders of magnitude speed up um, over the last decade. Um, and also, yeah, more more interactive features um, are generally now possible. So you know, can you build all of these dashboards um, with with kind of like the, the Lego blocks and put them all together? And it's a lot easier than it used to be. So. We kind of were talking to a lot of um, a lot of clients, and we sort of had a lot of recurring themes that they that they kind of um, wanted to guarantee, sort of uh, bring to their team. If they're setting up um, a team, or they already have one in place, there were these recurring issues of okay, so how can we guarantee you know sort of access permissions in, in some of these reports that we that we want to share and want to want to send out? Uh, we want to definitely you know want them 100 reliable. We want them definitely to be reproducible whenever we run them, and if we leave them for 12, 12, 18 months and then pick them up later. We want to actually know, okay, what generated that image way back when? If, you know, um, it may be, you know, some, some members of staff have moved on since then, but you need actually, you know, that guaranteed sort of audit trail right back um, to the beginning so you can tell what, what came from where. Um, so in sort, sort of setting this out, I think a, a, key, a key point is we didn't want to reinvent any wheels. Um, so we wanted to kind of sort of leverage existing things um, where possible. And that is, that is still kind of aim. Uh, but we, the ultimate thing was really, like, okay, can we sort of provide this interactive capability? Can we build 
this kind of web application portal um, and provide this level of interactability interactive uh, graphics and you know just sort of have a go see, see what we can come up with so the actual overview of, of the model of how you would sort of interact um, with this uh, sort of decision portal is that it can start from right from the analysts sort of working on themselves so using this as, as a central store um, and you know sort of uploading the code to that and, and working via the portal itself and then through that, you can also have like teams collaborating through through this portal, and then once it's kind of got to a certain level, and, the, and you know the report is kind of towards a, the uh, sort of latter sort of stages, and it's um, uh, undergone a lot of reviews and, and feedback incorporated, then you may want to send that on to you know your either in-house decision maker, or you can kind of use this sort of platform for uh, sharing your uh, results outside of the company. So if you're if you're um, uh, providing a service uh, to other customers, then you can use this as a way to distribute your results. And um, also the key part there is that any kind of IP that you would um, be generating as part of it, you're still holding on to. So if this is running sort of in-house um, through a web portal, you've got um, control over the code, you don't need to distribute that, um, at that out to the wider world, and you can have your customers sort of come to you sort of via, uh, via the web. So the, yeah, so the, the key thing is really, it will, with kind of an analytic report written this way, you're starting off with a, the very sort of rough and ready version and then getting further along to a final version, which is um, then released uh, to the wider world. So after sort of thinking about this for a long time and gathering quite a few requirements, we basically had a go. Um, and so we built a prototype. And it kind of boiled down into these four parts that we needed to, to kind of put together. Um, you, need, you basically needed the web application part, so you needed uh, the back end um, to uh, basically do all the really clever stuff that no one really sees. Um, so taking care of authentication and storage of, of the actual reports. Um, but then you also wanted to you know, um, basically make this thing you know, attractive and aesthetically pleasing. So you need a front end as well um, on top of that. So you need something to take care of the styling. And uh, there's also needs to be um, some kind of scripting um, sort of execution service, really, that just handles and runs this code to actually generate these reports, um, and something to do the interactive visualization. So these are the, the basically the component, the, the tools that we use for, for each part. So for the web front and back end, it was um, basically using the Flask library, which um, and uh, and some and Python code. To do the styling, uh, we use the Bootstrap CSS library. I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with the theme. It's, it's in a large percentage of websites out there these days. Um, and for the actual intera interactive visualizations part, we chose to um, use a library called Rcharts, which is actually a wrapper to a lot of other JavaScript libraries, um, kind of uh, as sort of, you know, the, the, the first trial case, basically, the um, uh, first, uh, uh, first stab at it. So Flask, what is Flask? I've kind of, kind of said this a, a, a little bit already, but um, I guess its main kind of uh, remit is, is very lightweight. It, you can build web applications using Flask, but it was actually, um, I think historically, um, it was put together as an April Fool's sort of joke, almost, um, at uh, a PyCon conference. And it was a guy who basically stripped out the core components of Django, which is a very big sort of monolithic web application framework, and given you just the essential parts that you need. Um, but then people started to get really on board with this, and they found this really useful. And the reason is you can start small and then just add on the bits that you need. You don't no longer have to sort of get the whole kitchen sink and then work out how to use it before you actually then um, go on to build something. Uh, and I think this is kind of summed up by their sort of tagline. And, um, if you go to their website, they're their sort of tagline is, you know, web development one drop at a time. And it is kind of like all of these, the, the base kind of Flask library is very small, but there's a lot of these modular extensions that people have come up with. So you can just build and customize your solution uh, and get a lot more freedom in uh, basically what you develop. So this is a big, big contrast to uh, how Django stands at the minute, where if you use the database that comes with Django and the templating uh, that comes with Django and all the Django stuff, it all works brilliantly. But if you want to customize any of that outside of that, it, it becomes uh, a little bit more of a struggle to work with. Um, so why Flask? Well, essentially, there's the two parts that, um, that it produces, uh, that, or that it gives you. So it handles all of the HTTP requests for you. 
um, and also provides this HTML templating. So you don't have to hard, hard code all of the HTML by hand. You can pass in parameters and actually put some programming logic within there. And this leads to much easier to, main, uh, easier to maintain code, and it's much more flexible then as a, um, as a result going forward. If you need to change things um, or change themes or anything, you only have to do it in one place, not across a, every single other page. Um, so to give you a very quick sort of overview of, of you know, the code um, a little bit. I'd say don't pay attention to the, to the top and the bottom lines. All the top's doing is importing the necessary parts. All the bottom's doing um, is saying, if you run this script, start the application. So to actually get your bare bones sort of app there, you've, just got, you've uh, basically got to initialize the class by just giving it a name. Um, and then define these kind of view functions, which when you navigate to a particular directory, this is the code that gets executed. And, uh, or sorry, navigate to a particular URL, this is then the function that will, that will be executed as a result. So if I went to you know, uh, mywebsite.com uh, slash user slash Dave, then this is actually quite clever. It's gonna take what I give it as Dave and pass that in as a parameter. This then goes into the templating. And so you can start having this um, very easy way of building up a uh, very RESTful API if you, um, if you want to in not much time at all. Um, also come to the lot of other extensions, as I've, I've, um, I've uh, also mentioned. Uh, the key ones that, that I drew upon was uh, SQL Alchemy, so you actually you get a lot of uh, database compatibility with this one package. It essentially, uh, it's a wrapper around uh, a lot of database drivers. Um, so if you end up switching between you know, a sort of a SQLite database to a Postgres, then you just change one line of code and it's fine. Um, and also there's other libraries there for authentication and dealing with the styling and um, dealing with web forms. But the other main reason is also, because it's in Python, you get to draw upon the, a much wider ecosystem there, um, which goes, it doesn't it encompass a lot of tools for data analysis, but also goes quite far beyond that. So you've got tools for web scraping, for database interaction, as I've already said with SQL Alchemy, uh, symbolic mathematics, if that's, um, if that's your bag, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole whole list there. And if, if anyone's interested, there's a um, crowdsourced sort of curated list of all the awesome Python libraries there. And I think if you could just Google on GitHub, um, awesome Python, there's, there's quite a few. There's actually a very, very long growing list. So this is kind of the other reason. Um, but we also want this interactive graphics component. And at the time, this is not like kind of, you know, Python's strong point. So the kind of root of least resistance um, was to use a library called rcharts, which actually wraps seven different JavaScript libraries um, and allows you then to uh, write R code, which using this library will then give you back the JavaScript. And then this is what we fed over to Flask, and then that's what get re gets rendered in the final page. And we generally wanted to avoid writing low-level JavaScript, mostly because this is not a common tool um, in the analyst's toolbox. So having a go at abstracting away from that um, and seeing what we can do um, with the tools we already know. So this is where I will cross my fingers. So in that, in that time, um, managed to actually come up with this system to kind of you know, store these analytic reports uh, and uh, deal with the, the permissions issue and the and um, sort of access rights. Uh, there's, it also takes uh, static and dynamic plots, so I'm uh, simply writing to stand it out as part of the um, part of the R script process. So any GG plot uh, would um, or static plot that you make with GG plot or, or lattice or whatever would also um, work in that exact same system. Uh, takes care of the, and it also takes care of the rendering of Markdown um, to HTML. So it looks. Um, um, so you can include links a lot easier and you don't have to then force the analyst to write everything in HTML. Um, and yes, this is currently an in-house prototype that we, um, that we are exploring. So in this, what went well? Well, um, I think it was great to see that, you know, with Flask and all of these extensions, there is enough to, you know, cobble, cobble everything together and build a very customized um, and... Uh, yeah, robust system really. I mean, it's it, it's an, it's a nice um, nice set of tools. Uh, learning them one at a time means that you fully take them on board and then bring them all together, and so you have confidence in what you're uh, what you're producing. The HTML templating saved um, saved a lot of work in getting the in, in getting uh, the HTML and the CSS all all there. 
Um, and also embedding R within a, a larger application um, is, a, is actually quite, um, quite easy. Um, and uh, if, uh, yeah, again, back to my workshop, if you attended that, uh, I went over a, a load of other methods to, um, uh, to go through uh, and, and to work with these two things. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options there. And these, are, these all went well. What went not so well um, was essentially this, um, to actually utilize fully the, yeah, the JavaScript libraries that are being written, um, then you kind of needed to know the JavaScript libraries themselves. So uh, while we wanted to avoid writing JavaScript, it was still you needed to go down to that low level to understand all the parameters, which were then passed via, the, via R down to, down to that level. And also the JavaScript libraries themselves are very fast evolving. So the one that I actually used there was a, um, a JavaScript library called NVD3, and I think it's been, uh, there's been multiple attempts to port that library and rewrite it and um, try to uh, basically refactor it, and some of those projects have worked well and some of them have sort of stalled, so it's not quite clear where the latest version of that is. Um, and so, sort of, yeah, rely, relying on, on all of these sort of technologies on top of the other, just gotta be careful that um, you, know, you keep track of versions and you keep keep making sure that everything will still work together. Uh, so the roadmap uh, for coming for, for the future um, is basically to kind of, now that we've shown that we can do this, um, is to kind of expand it um, in a lot of potentially different directions. Um, so the main sort of uh, idea, I think, is to kind of have this as a technology agnostic kind of platform. So here we used R to kind of drive generating the um, interactive plot, uh, but there's no reason you couldn't use um, Python to do the same. Um, or also uh, you know, Scala or something else that you wanted to, another script that you wanted to execute, um, so long as it can uh, you know, sort of have access to, the, uh, to generating the necessary JavaScript un underneath. Um, and also the other, the other thing I want to um, try and do is build more on existing technology. So um, uh, since I kind of like uh, developed this, then there's been a, a lot of improvements um, in uh, in Shiny, in Shiny dashboards have come, uh, have, have come a very long way, uh, and also in, in uh, Plotly dashboards, and also the uh, IPython notebook, which uh, recently got properly rebranded into uh, sort of you know, version four, is now known as the Jupyter um, notebook. Which, um, if you haven't come across, it's a um, it's meant to be a very technology agnostic platform, very much like writing you know um, sort of code chunks uh, using Nitar. But this is, again, through a web interface. So if you can uh, sort of wrap this on top, um, then this can uh, be a way of drawing on uh, tools that analysts are already using um, in their day-to-day. -day. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the other one is that um, at the minute, a lot of uh, the, the data is basically embedded with all the JavaScript. It's all in the browser. It's all there at once. And there is, there's obviously limitations to that as the data scales. Um, so other possibilities to, uh, to look into libraries like Bokeh, where um, one of the uh, features of that is it actually offers an, a nice way to decouple the, um, the data from the actual visualization. And so you can update the data, which then gets fed to the visualization. And so this allows you to do more streaming data applications. Um, so that's also, that's also there. So in conclusion, um, I've uh, basically hopefully convinced you that you know, having this kind of higher level um, sort of web application on top of these tools can be a good, good way to sort of centralize everything. And it's the, uh, the building blocks are now out there. This is totally possible. Um, and so you can start addressing some of these uh, potential concerns that you have, may have over um, you know, access permissions, reproducibility, and uh, guaranteeing that, um, that audit trail when, um, uh, and uh, saving that. Uh, and also that uh, Python and Flask is a very good combination. Um, to uh, build up these web applications in a short space of time and yeah, for basically wrapping up R or any of the other processes underneath. And uh, yeah, decision point, it, it is a currently an in-house prototype and we're currently looking at ways of potentially sending it one way or the other. And if this is something of interest, I'm very happy to talk to you and see, um, see what your priorities may be. <laughs>